we negate. Contention one is dividing America. Infrastructure spending is subject to a distribution gap where the majority of its benefits go to the upper class. Emily Goff of the Institute for Economic Policy explains that powerful and special interest groups have a huge sway on where and how infrastructure projects are implemented, making it nearly impossible for politicians to address real issues facing the poor. This is because, as John Ebenezer of Morehouse College writes, the entrenched structure of money in politics ensures that the government disregards low-income inner-city neighborhoods. As a result, Erica Villa of the University of Minnesota writes that the majority of infrastructure funding flows to richer areas, only widening economic gaps and disregarding the poor. Anthony Randazzo of the Reason Foundation verifies that 85% of infrastructure grants go to counties with median incomes above the national average. Even when the poor are in the vicinity of infrastructure, its benefits are not long-lasting. New projects attract richer residents to neighborhoods, driving property values up, and displacing the poor who cannot afford higher rent. Stephanie Pollack of Northeastern University confirms that in almost 90% of cases, increased public tr transportation investment, for example, increased housing costs at a rate faster than surrounding communities, pricing low-income people out of their neighborhood. This displacement is harmful because A, it means the poor have to leave the communities with infrastructure, denying them of its benefits, and B, Chester Hartman of the Institute for Policy Studies quantifies that gentrification causes up to 87% of displacees to pay more than they originally did in rent and increases prices for those who stay by as much as 50%. As long as the rich continue to be the primary beneficiaries of infrastructure, the gap only widens. Stefan Trinbrowski of Seattle University quantifies that each one standard deviation increase in infrastructure investment increases income inequality by 8.5%. Contention 2 is deconstructing poverty traps. Jessica Lieber of MIT explains that most people currently in poverty struggle to meet their basic needs and thus prioritize their short-term necessities over long-term success. Means tested welfare must be prioritized because according to Sarah Steinberg of the Center for American Progress, the social safety net helps to provide basic needs and keep families afloat in difficult times, thereby breaking the cycle of deep poverty. These programs are drastically underfunded. For example, Hillary Hoynes of the NPR writes that the Earned Income Tax Credit, or EITC, which provides material assistance to workers and incentivizes greater labor participation, requires a $1,000 per person increase to reduce poverty by additional 9% and increase employment by up to 8%. Laura T. Hanna of the Economic Research Service furthers that current investments in the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, reduces the poverty rate by 16% and extreme poverty by 50%. But according to the Children's Defense Fund, more than half of families using SNAP are still food insecure because the program is lacking funding. Finally, Will Fisher of the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities reports that the Housing Choice Voucher Program, or HCV, which subsidizes rent for the poor, reduces homelessness by 75%, but only one in every four eligible citizens receive vouchers due to insufficient funding. This is just a piece of the puzzle. Ron Kenworth of the University of Chicago holistically analyzes American welfare policies and quantifies that each 1% increase in transfer spending reduces absolute poverty by 1.7%. Eric Jesko with Stanford Furthers, expanding the safety net would help to provide financial support necessary to cover basic necessities, freeing up time and resources for the poor to pursue jobs. Sandy DePaul of New York Times confirms that expanding welfare in 2008 cut joblessness by 21%, while the U.S. Department of Commerce quantifies that most recipients are off welfare in less than two years. The impact is the, res uh, is the resolution of intergenerational poverty traps. Sarah Minton of the Urban Institute projects that increasing funding for SNAP, EITC, and HCV alone to sustainable levels will reduce child poverty in the U.S. by 60%, suggesting an overall welfare expansion will pull 10 million families out of the poverty trap. This enables them to succeed in the long term as the CDF quantifies that pulling people out of deep poverty makes them three times less likely to be poor 30 years down the road, and for these reasons we are very proud to negate. Okay, first, can I see some cards? So first, in your contention one, the one standard deviation increase increases income inequality by 8.5%. And then second, we also would like to see the um, plus 1% um, transfer leads to a negative 1.7% uh, decrease in poverty. Yep. And last, the three times likely less likely to be poor. That's just from deep childhood poverty and yeah. deep poverty. Okay, uh, can I get that to you after your case? Uh, so I have time to pull up. If you want it now, that's fine. Just yeah, can we, can we have it now? Yeah, sure. Thanks. And we're, we're going to run part two. So. Oh, okay. So I can actually the tension. What was the second thing you asked for? Uh, the minus plus one percent transfer. Yeah, got it. So uh, just go to the Dropbox and the maxis thing should be 
first one, or it's, if it's gonna take doesn't count against your prep to look at evidence. Okay. Yeah. So you guys just look. I have it. So this right here is eight point four five Yeah, by eight point four five percent. And this is uh, one two one point seven five percent. So it doesn't count against prompts review. No, it doesn't count against prompts review. Not TFC. Sure, you can take half an hour just for uh, reading yeah. the other documents. Oh, obviously not. Like, so yeah, yeah. I think this is unrealistic. Yeah, yeah. I, just, I think, think we're like, I think you got to time it. That's right. Part of your. Um, by that, yes, I mean, time from yeah. now yeah. on. Yeah, that's right. I thought I thought that it was supposed to be time set. You know, like, it's just like it should be time. Yeah. Yeah, we'll just. Thank you. All right, going straight to roll. Are you ready to roll? Mm -hmm. Am I judge? We affirm contention one redistribution. Wallace Turco, a demos in 2015, writes that the U.S. financial sector is the largest contributor to income inequality. As big banks on Wall Street accumulate wealth, they do so without reinvesting into the economy, resulting in less opportunities and depressed wages for poor Americans. Infrastructure spending redistributes wealth in two ways. First, cutting dividend payments. Eric Pionin of the Fiscal Times in 2015 writes that currently, money for infrastructure spending comes from reducing the dividend payments that banks receive from holding shares of the Federal Reserve. Preston proves this as Ellen Brown of the Public Banking Institute in 2016 furthers that in its most recent infrastructure bill, Congress cut the amount of dividend payments that banks would receive and created $17 billion to put into the Federal federal Highway Fund. This is critical because infrastructure spending redistributes wealth into infrastructure that serves lower income brackets. Second, increasing corporate burdens. Nick Timmerhaus of the Wall Street Journal in 2015 explains that while crafting budgets for 2016, Congress underscored the increasing uh, importance of increasing taxes on corporations. The CEG in 2015 further that infrastructure spending is low right now because of an abundance of loopholes used by corporate lobbyists. Closing loopholes in the U.S. will generate $590 billion over the next decade and $90 billion every subsequent year, enough to put a fight against failing infrastructure. This spending helps the poor in two ways. First, transportation. Jillian White of the Atlantic in 2015 writes that transportation in poor communities suffer from constant breakdowns and long wait times. Unfortunately, The Economist in 2012 reports that we only appropriate 40% of the $255 billion needed to keep transportation in good condition. Wade Henderson of the LCCHR furthers that equitable transport, transport infrastructure 
transportation investments are required to level the jobs playing field for millions of low-income families. Finding that each billion dollar investment into transportation creates and supports 36,000 new jobs in the community. Sarah Kaufman in NYU in 2015 further said in New York, reducing transit time from 48 to 33 minutes opens up 527,000 more accessible jobs. Second, education. Jeffrey Vincent of UC Berkeley writes that public schools are an integral facet of public infrastructure in the U.S. Unfortunately, Chris Mott, the CBPP, finds that two-thirds of states have cut education funding, causing public schools to rely upon local taxes. Greg Duncan of UCI in 2011 writes that rich communities gaining access to quality education while the poor lose out as entrenched income inequality. However, Karabu Jackson of Northwestern University finds that increasing school spending significantly benefits the poor. He finds in a 40-year meta-analysis that increasing school funding by 20% increases future family income by 50% and decreases long-term poverty by 20%. Contention to foreign investment. Tim O'Hankel of Brookings in 2010 finds that sound infrastructure is critical for overseas investment. Unfortunately, since U.S. infrastructure quality has been neglected, the U.N. in 2015 writes that FDI inflows have fallen to only $86 billion, a third of our 2013 levels. Appealing infrastructure attracts foreign investment through lower production costs in new markets. Such a makeup of ISB in 2012 empirically shows that a one standard deviation increase in infrastructure increases FDI inflows by 52%. FDI curbs income inequality in three key ways. First, closing the skills gap. The UN in 2011 explains that FDI increases the skills of human capital. It raises the demand for skilled workers more than the available supply and pressures local firms into training their low-skilled workers to match market demands. Second, raising wages. FDI raises the overall demand for domestic labor. The resultant wage premiums especially help the lower class since businesses set wages high enough to attract job seekers but low enough to stay profitable. The Department of Commerce in 2013 quantifies that on average, FDI jobs earn $19,000 more than other jobs. Third, mitigating recessions. Recessions especially harm the poor because fi financial distress results in slashed wages and laid off workers as firms attempt to retain profitability while shifting the cost onto the lower middle class. John Graham of Duke in 2014 quantifies that just two years after a firm files bankruptcy, employee wages declined by 30%. However, Martin Feldstein of the NBER in 2000 explains that foreign investment reduces overall risk to investors by spreading the economic shocks out over several countries. Thus, the ISL in 2006 examines over 100 countries and concludes that FBI inflows ultimately reduce income inequality in developed nations. Please affirm. Thank you. Um, we'll use a little bit of time. scenario if A causes B, do you prioritize A first because that has to be done first? Can you just explain it in the terms of the resolution? Okay, so if we have to have welfare before we have infrastructure, should we prioritize welfare first? Why, why do we need to have welfare first? I'd say that right now we need to press the most pressing need right now and for one of the most pressing needs is evaluating what needs to be done okay. over a magnitude. So okay. right now FDI is going down. We need to address something that can Wait. increase this. So FDI if first. we physically cannot address FDI before addressing welfare first, you still want to prioritize FDI? No, like we're saying that we shouldn't be prioritizing welfare right now because we've been doing so for the past 40 years. Sure. And spending on welfare has been increasing while well, spending on infrastructure has been decreasing. Right okay. now, we need to be prioritized what needs the money right now. Can okay. I ask you a question? Actually, no. Like going much to this topic, right, about what has to be done first, how do these people get a job if they don't even have a house? What? How okay, first people? of all, you're going to be saying that housing is the prereq to all this stuff, right? Uh, housing and a lot of other things like food. Okay. Okay, so wait, you're just talking about housing. So let's talk about housing really quick. So one of the problems that are plaguing housing is the fact that there aren't actually public housing available. And public housing is one of the vessels that welfare needs. And if we're just going to talk about what needs to come first, like public housing is defined, Levi's going to come in a model. And public housing is a form of public infrastructure. And one of the things that is harming the poor is that they don't have this, like, these welfare programs that the housing right. vouchers, they don't First have the house. That's definitely not true, right? If they don't have any money, they can't afford the house. No, 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 no. I'm saying that we need the houses okay, first sure. before the welfare programs actually that's, work. That might be infrastructure, but it's not topical because we're looking at public infrastructure. No, no, like public it's infrastructure public, is housing, generally... public housing units were given to the Why? poor through these welfare Okay, what is public infrastructure? Program. Okay, it's something that can be accessible to the poor. To everyone. Yeah. 
So if I if I'm poor and I don't have any income, do I still have access to a full house? Well, you're you're not going to get access to a house if there isn't a house available in the market for you to have. Okay, it. let's like, say that there's a free house. Public, right? These public housing units are what this welfare no, no, programs use no, no, in order no, no. to get. Let's okay, say there, let's say there's like an empty house down the road. Am I like fully? Uh, do I have like full access to that there, house? No, it's not. Yeah, it's, it's not, not public because it's not. It's not, it's not, not a public, public housing anyone. unit here. We're not getting anywhere here. Can I ask no, you it's, questions? Okay, Two sure. minutes, okay? Go ahead. Okay, so you're talking about all these poverty, uh, poverty, um, like EITC yeah. food stamps and all that. Mm-hmm. So wh- where does this like prioritize, prioritization come in? Okay, play? we tell you that these three programs are successful right now, but there's a huge deficiency. For example, if we increase EITC by a thousand dollars per person, we can decrease poverty by additional nine percent. Okay. But furthermore, when we look towards these food stamps, okay. half of these people that get food stamps are hungry because there's not enough money. Can I ask you another question, Barton? You just had one. Okay, yeah, you've been, you're asking questions for two minutes though, and I just asked one question. Go ahead. Okay, so when you're talking about your contention one, is your impact to gentrification? Uh, that's one of the impacts. So what's the other impact? So either they get gentrified or they just pay more, which increases the income rate of quality. Yeah. Okay, so like why why can why can't in the affirmative world that these infrastructure go to the poorer settlements? So we recognize that there's only forty percent of the money required for transportation okay. is being invested sure. here. So if we increase this funding, it's gonna be going to okay. the poor, right? Either the the infrastructure goes to the poor, which increases gentrification, or it doesn't go to the poor, which we see happens most of the time, and that just means that the poor doesn't get any benefits from the infrastructure because they don't even live in that area. first contention which deals with redistribution. Essentially what they're telling you is that through infrastructure projects you're moving money away from the rich to the poor. The first big problem with this argument is that holistically welfare is better for redistribution because the logical welfare is literally moving money from the rich to the poor. Whereas with infrastructure there's a couple of problems in terms of redistribution. First, Michelle Chen of the City University of New York explains that even when you're building public infrastructure, most of the time the government contracts private companies to construct it and operate the infrastructure like tolls and things like that. And as a result, private companies have more to gain from the accumulation of the capital in these infrastructure projects. And thus she finds that one, private companies drive down wages for labor that happens in infrastructure projects, harming the poor and benefiting corporations. But two, because there's all these private advantages, it offsets the benefits of the public increasing income inequality. The second overall problem with this argument is what we tell you in our case, that 85 percent of infrastructure funding flows to richer areas. They're going to come up here in the next speech and tell you that, well, we can just invest it in poorer areas. Remember that, one, we have to look to what's probable, not just something they can advocate for that would never happen in the real world, but two, and more importantly, in the few scenarios where infrastructure funding goes to poorer areas, what Robert told you in case is it attracts richer residents into the area, increasing housing prices and pushing the poor out. So in both worlds, the poor don't really benefit. But with that in mind, go to their two specific forms. The first one they talk about is a decrease in dividends. Essentially, they say we should finance infrastructure by reducing these payments. The first big problem with this argument is that they give you no reason why you use this to finance infrastructure, but you couldn't use it to finance welfare. It's just not unique to the resolution. It's not an advantage of infrastructure, but rather the financing process. The second big problem comes from the Wall Street Journal, which finds that the majority of infrastructure funding that's currently on the table is coming from things like gas taxes and excise taxes, which raises the cost of goods that the poor rely on. These regressive taxes are bad at increasing income inequality. According to Adele Morris at the Brookings Institution, gas tax 
taxes hit the poor five times harder than they hit the rich. This is important because it means that one, the majority of financing is going to be harming the poor, but two, of the one kind of financing they talk about, it's not unique to infrastructure. Let's move to their second thing that they talk about, which is closing corporate loopholes. Now this argument makes no sense entirely because what they're saying is we should close loophole to save money and then we should use that money for infrastructure. That's not a benefit of infrastructure. That's the way you get to infrastructure. Again, you can use that money for welfare as well. It's not a unique advantage. Now let's move to their two unique advantages from infrastructure. The first is increasing transportation investment. We have a number of responses. First, right off the bat, according to the VTPA, the rich benefit more from the increase in mobility coming from public transportation because they have better access to jobs and capital. And as a result, even if you're seeing benefits from the poor from this mobility, you're still seeing a greater increase in income inequality. My second response comes from the Cato Institution, which finds that the financing of current public transportation products on the table, like for example, subway stations, leads to cut in other types of public transportation, like things like bus stops and the like. And this is important because he finds that these types of uh, public transportation that the poor currently rely on are being cut, therefore inc uh, decreasing readership for the poor and increasing readership for the rich, such by uh, increases in income inequality. The third and final thing they talk about is an increase in the number of jobs. There's a lot of problems with this argument. The first is that these jobs are incredibly short term. They talk about construction jobs, but they don't tell you that five years down the road these impacts really matter for income inequality. Second off, according to the Economic Policy Institute, whereas in the recession there were seven job seekers for every one job available, that ratio has fallen to 1.3 job seekers for every one job, and we are very close approaching the one-to-one -one ratio. This is important because as the same study points out, the problem in America right now is not creating more jobs, it's creating people who can go and fill those jobs, which means a couple of things. One, we should be investing in welfare programs like the Pell Grant, which increases access to skilled education, but two, you should provide people with their basic needs, because as Robert told you in our case, when people have their basic needs met, they're more able to go out and fill those jobs. Then the second thing to talk about is funding schools, but according to the Social Infrastructure Fund, funding schools is not a form of public infrastructure, because public infrastructure is very broadly defined as something that everyone can access. There's a class of infrastructure called social infrastructure, which is only accessed by certain subsets of people, like children go to school, and low-income people go to public housing development, so it's not topical. On their contention to about FDI, there's two big responses. The first is that there's no real big increase in FDI from fixing our infrastructure, because according to the New York Times, America still has an abundance of FDI. They talk about an increase in stability, but it's not going to be major. But second, according to Chang of Stanford, because FDI helps private corporations more than it helps the poor, it increases income quality on net by 2%. That means that when you evaluate all of their impacts and ours, you're still seeing a net harm to society. This is your last card that says that FDI increases income in core by 2%. Yeah.
Okay, let's look at first what's most important in today's round. Recognize that well, currently welfare spending is on the incline while transportation spending is on the decline. According to the CBO, over the past 40 years, the percentage of GDP related to welfare spending has gone up 3%. While in the same time, the CBO, or not in the CBO further from 2003 to 2014, spending on infrastructure has gone down 5%. That's key because Jeffrey Myron of the Cato Institute says that with welfare spending, there's a lot of overhead, and so welfare spending doesn't actually accomplish its goal. That's why it furthers that the benefits that my opponents are trying to talk about in welfare, the reason they haven't triggered yet is because welfare is incredibly inefficient and there's a lot of overhead and waste. At that point, make them prove that this will be a shift from the status quo in order to buy any of their impacts. First, let's go to their contention one. So first, they talk about transportation, right? But I have three responses. First, if they're if they talk about gentrification, if they talk about that's happening in the status quo, that inherently means that transportation is occurring in lower income areas. So at that point, at flow, or flow impacts of transportation will occur in low income areas. But second, remember the resolution is with the goal to alleviate income inequality. That's the shift. With the goal to alleviate income inequality, that's why the transportation will occur in lower income areas. But third, their Cato card says that when we open up um, new like infrastructure in the rich areas, that we're closing them and their poor counterparts. That's key because that clearly shows a lack of funding. We don't have the funding to open up both at the same time. But if we increase funding, we can keep the um, infrastructure in poor areas open, even if you buy the fact that the infrastructure will go to the rich. And at that point, increasing spending on infrastructure is still going to benefit the um, poor. But now let's look to their impact of gentrification. So first, you can turn this because by all of Georgetown law says that um, property values um, from housing actually rise in gentrifying neighborhoods. And that's key because what my opponents are going to try and say is that they're, that's why that the people in these areas can't afford their houses. But the thing is, Meltzer says that in gentrifying neighborhoods, because like middle class people and upper class people do move in, it's going to increase employment opportunities. So the lower class class people are going to go from having no jobs to higher jobs. That's key because they're going to get jobs which will allow them to pay for the higher property taxes which will have two key benefits. First, that the property taxes are spent on education. And that's why Kenyon of the Lincoln Institute says that with an increase in gentrifying neighborhoods and increase in property taxes, that's going to make the education quality better which is going to reduce income inequality. And then second, that property or that you can turn this because McKinnish of the MBER says that gentrification lowers racial inequality because more affluent people are going to move into these neighborhoods at the same time as the lower class people being able to stay, which will further reduce income inequality. So at that point, since they have no more impacts to their contention one, let's go to their contention two about the poverty trap. So first, let's talk about a specific card. Their card um, about or their card about Canberra the UNC, which is their biggest card because it actually says that increased funding will eliminate income inequality. It says that it might. It doesn't actually show causality. But at that point, look to the overview, which says that it won't because of overhead and waste. Now let's look to their specific advocacy. First, the EITC. So Bix of the National Affair says that the EITC actually is a poverty trap because the more income, lower income people get, the less they're going to receive of the EITC. That's key because it's going to decrease productivity and not allow people to get out of poverty. Now, let's look to SNAP. The CBPP explains that funding is increasing in the status quo for um, for the SNAP and food stamp programs. That's key because the resolution says to prioritize. Why would we prioritize something that is increasing in the status quo, make them show that we need to increase it even more in the, than in the status quo to buy any of their impact? And second, TN of UW says that the SNAP program actually increased um, like funding by a lot after the recession, and right now less people are needing it, so there's actually a surplus of funding, so there's no reason to prioritize it. Then they talk about housing. But the um, my first response is that Buell Center for the Columbia University writes that public housing units are an integral part of public infrastructure, and the, Insti or, or the Urban Institute furthers that only 3.2 million housing units are available for more than 11 million impoverished families. If you're going to prioritize, prioritize infrastructure because their one in four card is because people there aren't enough houses, not that there's not enough funding. So if we build more houses, we solve their problem and access all their benefits. And since we want what's best for the low-income people, please vote for it. Thank you. housing units for the people in public your public housing room. units, not just housing units, period. There were there was less housing, that's like okay, the gist so, of the card. So, so obviously how about if we build more housing, then they're going to have more so, like housing. So how does, a, how does the housing voucher work? Housing voucher? Yeah, that's what we're advocating. Okay, you tell me how it works. The way it works is that it subsidizes moving into private housing. It covers your rent. That's the reason why you don't need to build more public okay. housing developments. Why does it make sense to build because, eight million okay, so, public housing so here's the thing. Here's the thing, right? So would, we, would you agree that there's more than just housing vouchers and welfare? 
Well, of course. Okay. There's more than so, just transportation and education no, and infrastructure. I know, but you but don't have to pay for building bridges. Okay, for you. but the thing is, for welfare, right? Uh, there's a lot like that uh, that goes into housing, other than just like one specific advocacy of well or vouchers. So even if we yeah. buy what you're saying, if we increase the housing units, housing. then you can use so the other, the like, other housing related welfare that? program that exists right now. There's like housing assistance. Housing assistance is called a public HUD, which builds public housing. That's why public housing technically it does is not build advocacy. public housing. Okay. Can okay. I ask you a question? Yeah. Okay. Why? Would we? You're telling me that gas taxes are what's used for infrastructure, right? And like they they would yep. increase. Yep. When's the last time they've increased? Uh, we have like evidence saying that like the majority of uh, infrastructure bills right now rely on gas taxes. No, no, no. Okay, money. but here's the thing. Here's what's that's happening. What you said in for your no, here's the thing that's happening in Congress. Right? Let yeah. me explain. So gas taxes have been increased since 1993, and then people in Congress like have brought up. First, they brought up gas tax because that's what's used in the past. Nobody in Congress was ever able to agree on a way to increase gas taxes. Nobody like, in Congress you can, was able no, to agree no, no. to pass any okay, liberal wait, policy wait. because we have can a Republican Can I finish, Congress. please? I'm going to like yeah. link that into our argument. So that's why you're saying the proposed of happened about the gas taxes in Congress, proposed have happened, but they've okay. gone nowhere. So, so then, right no, no, okay. so then what's happened is they shifted to dividend payments and corporate taxes, which is what we're talking so about, really, and that's what's actually can happened you, in the Senate. Like a good question. Yeah, go for it. So you're saying that like the way our Congress wants to finance projects comes from these dividend taxes calling yeah. corporate loopholes, right? That is what's happening in the status quo, okay. yeah. So then, like, if the majority of the left is advocating, uses the exact same loopholes to, like, invest in welfare, what's the unique advantage to using that money for Because that's a that's if, and that's not what's happening. That's what's actually theory. happening. No, what okay. is actually Both happening? Both teams are allowed no, to no. advocate for a position, no, no, no. right? So here's, here's, here's the key difference. Like doing here's the key difference. In our anything. first warrant about corporate taxes, we literally tell you that this we past year... On this too, so. Okay, if this past year... Corporate taxes have been increasingly tied to public infrastructure. If you can tell me they've been tied to welfare, tied to the then government. sure, like go for it. But okay, that's not so what's happened. Like the end result is, if you should do something, you should do it in the most effective way. You're not giving me a reason to prioritize infrastructure to get that goal, so you don't. Okay, get no, we would love for it to happen now, the best like way. Okay, go for it. Okay, so what you said is that when there's gentrification, rich people bring like employment opportunities with them, so poor people don't move out, right? Yeah, because they'll get jobs. Like, okay, jobs so like, there. how long does it take to get jobs relative to like your rent going up by fifty percent in the next week, and you have to pay it? I would, ar I would argue the same amount of time. So there's no. That's not true because one million people are still displaced every year because of that same gentrification. Part overview, our voters, and then turns on their case. So, with that being said, is everyone ready? Okay. All right. They drop Libra that says that people have to focus on their short term impacts before they look towards long term jobs because the logic is really simple. You want food in the house before you can look for jobs, that goes drop. But the second they talk about how welfare spending has overhead, so it's not effective now, we tell you that right now EITC increases employment, staff decreases poverty by 50%, and HCP decreases homelessness by 75%. It's working right now, but it's not as effective as it can be. So if it works right now, we can increase the spending to make it more effective in the future. But with that being said, go to our first argument about dividing America and gentrification. They said that it increases employment opportunities, but it's not true if they don't have a food or house. That's why we tell you that two things might happen. One, they stay in the area, and then Hartman tells you that people have to pay 50% more, which only increases inequality, or two, they're displaced and they no longer live in that area, which means that one, they don't have a home anymore, but two, they don't get any benefits from the infrastructure because they literally don't live in that area anymore. And that's why Trinwaski tells you that infrastructure spending increases inequality by 8.5%. That's the first statistic on inequality and they never address it. But second, on deconstructing poverty traps, 
when they tell you that on SNAP there's no need to increase since it already benefited before. We completely agree that it decreased poverty before, but we also tell you that half of the families on SNAP is still food insecure because there's simply not enough funding. We can increase or you can decrease poverty by increased funding on SNAP that simply goes unaddressed. The second on HCV, they tell you that we need to build more houses. But remember, we tell you that building more is going to be social infrastructure and not public infrastructure. But more importantly, they literally still cannot afford a house if they don't have any money. That's why you have to increase the short term impacts of them having a house and them having an income before they can find a job. That's why Kenneth, uh, that's why Kenneth and Prepare tells you that uh, first, uh, their 1% increase in welfare increases 1%, uh, decrease 1% uh, in poverty. And Propel tells you that we cut jobs by 21%. Then Minton tells you that um, Minton tells you that we decrease child poverty by 6%, and we can lift 10 million families out of poverty. That's going to be a direct, in, uh, direct link into income inequality. And the CDM tells you that these families are three times less likely to be in poverty 30 years down the road. So in the long term, we're eliminating poverty, and they're not. But quickly on their case, on redistribution, remember that private companies are always involved in the building of infrastructure, and they always benefit the rich. On transportation, again, the rich benefit a lot more from public transportation. And on housing and schools and the FDI, the rich is going to be benefiting a lot more. And it's simply not public infrastructure. It's going to be social infrastructure. And that's why I should negate. Starting with Levi's overview, quickly going down their case, then going back up to our case and extending comments. Okay, starting. Right now. Remember what Levi said in this overview? This is that welfare spending has been increasing by five percent in GDP over the past ten years. But recognize that they, they didn't respond to what Levi said. This is that there's a lot of overhead costs and a lot of inefficiencies that they never adjust in their case. They don't say that increased spending is actually going to solve any of these impacts. Well, we're saying that increased spending over the past ten years has not achieved these benefits. Firstly, let's go into our contention about dividing America. They talk about how the benefit is not going to only going to go to the rich. First, remember that what Levi says, that the goal in mind is to alleviate income inequality. At that point, the, the, this transportation and all this infrastructure is going to go to poor. Second, they even they, they uh, contradict themselves with the Cato Carter rebuttal because they should say that when we're opening up new infrastructure in rich areas, we're closing the poor ones. That shows that there is a clear lack of funding. If we increase the funding, we're going to be helping the poor out in the long term. And let's look into impact really quick about gentrification. Remember what Levi says that property values rise and the poor incentivize to say, that's why Big Door says that these poor families are 15% less likely to move and increase their quality of life. Second, let's talk about their poverty traps really quick. Recognize the EITC, the EIS says, this is a poverty trap and it decreases productivity. There's no reason to increase funding. Food stamp, that there's already, we don't need any more funding for that. Lastly, with housing vouchers, the, uh, Barbara Sands says that the current housing vouchers are plagued with inefficiencies that actually benefit the rich more than the poor. They show no solvency for that. Now let's look onto our case. We're going to be winning first with the redistribution. Recognize that infrastructure spending in the status quo is the only way that we're actually going to be redistributing wealth from the rich to the poor. They show no way that welfare actually does this. We're going to be solving that. But second, let's look into transportation specifically. At the point that we've already dealing them from the fact that it's not going to benefit the rich, remember that um, there, there's going to be increases in job access. So this is that um, Kaufman, this is that if you decrease transportation tax by 15%, we increase job by 527,000. Second, talk about education. They say that's social infrastructure, but the NZAIF writes that social infrastructure is a facet of public infrastructure. That's what Carabo Jackson says, the increase of 20% funding is going to increase future family income by 50% and decrease long-term poverty by 20%. That's going to be really key because education is the linchpin into the future life. Like, next, let's talk about FDI. They completely drop it. They say that it's going to be increasing in income inequality, but the 100 country met the country meta analysis finds that it's going to be decreasing in income inequality. It's going to be raising wages by $19,000. We show the link in. They don't. Please vote pro. Thank you. Can I see where the meta analysis talks about inequality specifically? Yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
don't have to do this because the first time around they didn't. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah right. so this time around, but okay. we'll keep it short. You said we don't address overhead costs, right? And the inefficiencies of the workers. That's the first thing I address. And I tell you that they're working right now, but the problem is it's not effective because of the lack of funding. How is there more overhead and waste because of the lack of funding? Okay, that's not the argument mm -hmm. we're making. You guys said that because of overhead, there's no statistical benefit of welfare. Robert came up and read you a bunch of statistics that we read you in our case, and you never addressed So you're telling us that right? while there's a ton of welfare and waste, there's still benefits? Like there might be overhead, waste. but like, if, we, if we still benefit- Every government benefit project, project has waste. We live in the United okay, States. Yeah, like, in this room specifically knows. about housing vouchers, the Barbara Sand finds that there's this is one of the programs with the most inefficiencies, because there's these- uh, the, the criteria they have for like these housing vouchers yeah. actually benefit the rich and like okay, middle-income so people. Robert actually said this in our case. He said that because of a lack of funding, we've made the requirements more strict, so only one in four Wait, people. Wait, no, no, like, like, it's, it's not that it's strict. It's like even more broad now, and it's encompassing people that aren't poor. If you can like tell that a lack of funding has made housing you. vouchers more broad program. No, I'm saying that there's that inefficiencies in place. We're not saying that's a cause, a okay. cause of lack so of might money. Be We're saying that right now, it's not something we need to prioritize. Let's simplify the round, right? Like a lot of talk about very small aspects of the resolution. So in the big picture, right? Like, if we prove that welfare is holistically good or that expanding is holistically better than infrastructure, we still win regardless of certain policies of oversight, right? Okay. Sure. Okay. And on your side, you guys have to prove that infrastructure generally reduces income inequality. Yeah. And it's a yeah. Hard. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, especially if you're going to touch No, you haven't. When you drop the only study in the round that says that general investments in infrastructure in the U.S. increases income inequality by 8.5 percent. Robert extended it. I'll extend it in the final focus. Okay. So yeah, question. Well, all right. So when you're talking about this, let's talk about um, redistribution, right? So you're saying that you say that welfare is literally distributing from the rich to the poor, right? Yeah. yeah. When does that ever happen? Like, how? Okay. Because definitionally, welfare is when you take money from the government, from the rich, and you give it to like, the poor. Wait, no, welfare like, it just takes it from like tax revenues. Yeah, welfare is funded through progressive taxes. That's it would be antithetical to finance welfare through a tax that hits the poor because then they're being hit by the exact same thing they're getting, right? The reason you have welfare is to shift the equilibrium away from the rich and, and like it, the poor. And has that has that been working at all? I mean yeah, yeah. through every single statistic on a reduction. No, 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 like just the people how these kind of work. I mean, it's a warrant that feeds into the bigger statistics that we read you. Okay. We can't like isolate for the specific effect of the progressive taxes themselves, but we can isolate for the effect of welfare. That's something okay. you guys don't do for okay. us. Yeah, so yeah, let's, like, let's talk about... Okay, okay, okay. Actually, you guys have a question. So let's talk about gentrification, right? So why are, if the poor are incentivized to stay in like this really nice city after gentrification, they don't have enough money to stay there. No, okay, so, they here's, still stay there. so here's the thing, right? Yeah. So they do have enough money because we tell you that employment is going to increase. And here's the thing, you're only risk no, Wait, okay, okay so no, I talking about gen like you you just said in gentrifying neighborhoods, and in gentrifying neighborhoods there's gonna be like more middle class and affluent yeah. people that are going to come in, which yeah, is obviously push going to people out. No, so. they're not pushing people out because the people are going to be able to pay for their yeah. property yeah. taxes First because they, they will have employment so where they did so more people are ninety percent less likely to move out of gentrifying. The overall cost of living the people increases by 50%. No, like, but that. Levi says in Rolando that it's mitigated and even completely mitigated by the fact that they're getting more employment opportunities and better living conditions. Okay.